Magandang araw po sa inyo. Welcome po sa isa na namang episode ng online series ng Inang Pamantasan kung saan ang pagkatuto ay walang hangganan. Ito ang PNU Talks. I am Carneli Rakitiko, Special Science Teacher 5 from Philippine Science High School Main Campus and also PNU Batch 2005 and Batch 2011. I will be talking about sustainable assessment in the 21st century. And as early as now, I would like to thank PNU for inviting me to share with you what I've been very passionate about for the past two years. And at the same time, I also want to thank you for spending time with me today because I know that you are doing synchronous classes And some of you are probably checking uh, your students' outputs right now. And I hope that you're having an enjoyable time checking your students' uh, work, uh, even learning so much about them because of the works that they've turned in. And I hope that you're also satisfied with uh, the quality and uh, the things that are the fruits of their hard work because um, it has been like the output or the, the product of Uh, your teaching for the past uh, weeks. And I hope that, you, again, uh, you feel satisfied with all of them. Unfortunately, for many of us, this is our picture whenever uh, we check papers, that in the middle of our checking, we get dissatisfied, we get frustrated with the output of our students because it seems like they have not mastered the concepts that we taught them for, say, one quarter, that the mistakes are happening all over and all over again And it seems like, again, uh, we feel like they're not learning enough. And this happened to me once in my teaching career uh, in the past where I, when, when I was checking my students' work. And uh, I realized, I stopped and realized that maybe there's something amiss with what I did in the assessment process. Because the same things, the same mistakes are happening all over again. And so I thought that maybe, just maybe, I wasn't very clear about the expectations that I have for them in terms of the, the work that they I'd like, I expect to see or expect to read from their work. Maybe I wasn't able to explicitly teach them the standards, the norms expected for that particular output, for that output to be considered excellent or exemplary. And so there's clearly a gap between my expectations, and the reality, which is the output of my students. And uh, there's, of course, a huge problem in that because you get disappointed as a teacher and your students also do not learn completely, holistically in the process. So what could be the remedy to this is that a teacher and a student help each other um, fill in this gap between expectations and reality through what I discovered as sustainable assessment. And what is sustainable assessment? According to Bud and Falchikov in 2006, it is when we emphasize uh, mastery of skills that they need in the present to master, of course, and be able to um, apply these skills, not only skills, but attitudes, dispositions, or qualities that they need to be successful professionals or successful adults in general in the future. So take note once again that the focus is not just on the skill, but on their holistic uh, personhood and their char uh, character, their personality that would again contribute to their success in the future. And not only their success, but to their satisfaction as a human being in the future. And what's very unique about this um, sustainable assessment is that the assessment process is mutually constructed, meaning to say the students have a say on the assessment process and even the criteria used to judge their work. Now, I will give an example of that later on. So let me focus on the seven principles of good feedback practices by Nicole and Mafferling Dick, which they published in 2005. And I will be walking you through one by one, and I'll try my best to give concrete examples from my own experiences in my classes. The first principle is to clarify what good performance is through an exemplar or an exemplary work or model. And it can be an expert's work, say, for example, a famous writer's work that they can emulate, or simply your previous student's work that you think is exemplary and worth emulating for your students. Here's an, uh, a sample performance task, and here's one of my favorite, a haiku postcard performance task. 
And usually, I also discuss haiku with a lesson on imagery to help the students uh, become more poetic using uh, powerful images in their creative work. And I'll read the performance task here. It says, we would like to send a haiku postcard to our relative who has stayed in Japan for several years, and you would want to express how you have missed him or her. Design your own postcard, and your original haiku will serve as your message for him or her. Make sure you include all the elements of haiku in your composition. So here's an example on the right side, which I got from Google. Now, before I even ask them to um, separate ways and do their own work independently, of course, the first thing that I have to do is to clarify what I expect of a quality haiku so that they would also know how to do this perfectly, if not perfectly, at least uh, something, uh, a work that they would be proud of. You know? So what we do is uh, we usually discuss uh, the elements, the characteristics, the usual normal features that are expected of a proper haiku, right, or a creative haiku. So allow the students to, to uh, or you elicit from the students these characteristics. You don't have to give a boring lecture about these elements, uh, these norms about uh, a perfect haiku. But you allow the students to, to look at a per, uh, an exemplar like this by Isa. And you ask them, what makes Isa's haiku, say, for example, exemplary here? What are the elements that make this particular haiku exemplary? Right, And then it becomes a student-centered discussion wherein you draw out from them what it means to have a quality output or a quality height to be very specific. Okay, And then later on, after everything is clear about what's expected of them in their task, you can already lead them to a discussion on the criteria that need, uh, that need to be used in order to grade their work. So in here, uh, we will have this what we call negotiated assessment in sustainable assessment, where the students have a say on the criteria that will be used for grading their work. And in here, you will have a healthy discussion on what else matters to your subject or your topic. What should be graded in their work? Say, for example, would they want their drawings to be graded in the postcard? Would they, would they want their handwriting? Because some teachers do that, right? They um, like they grade the cleanliness, the orderliness of the work, something like that. So you allow the students to uh, lay down the priorities that they want to, to have in this particular assessment. So in this way, uh, assessment is not just a one-way process. It's a, it's a more student-centered kind of assessment because, again, you allow the students to have a say on the, the assessment process, on how they're going to be graded, okay? All right. Now, another thing that you can do is, um, like in my class, this is a very concrete example. Just like a while ago, I uh, allowed my students to discuss what makes a quality abstract. So I put them in breakout rooms and they discussed among themselves what makes this abstract persuasive. What makes this abstract worthy of a slot in a, say, for example, international conference? So I gave them, to help them, I gave them this uh, rubric as their standard for, for in the meantime, right? And then I allowed them to grade the work quantitatively so that they could have a more, a more accurate judgment of the work. And then, of course, they justify amongst themselves why that grade, uh, why this abstract deserves this particular grade. Okay, that's one thing that you can do. All right. Another thing is if you want to be more creative, you can have poll applications like Slido in order to have a more creative discussion on what quality work means. Say, for example, in this case, in a Filipino class, you can discuss like uh, what makes Trece astounding, what makes it uh, creative or interesting. And then the students will input their answers. And then later on, you process their answers. Say, for example, which ones of the answers are not that reasonable, which ones are are worthy of a slot in the like the rubrics that you're going to use to grade their own comic book later on that they will produce after reading Trese. All right. So again, you allow the students to realize that what the norms are or what the characteristics or standards are. So that the, that the teachers also will be very transparent about the standards and will not have hidden standards and be unfair to the students. Okay. 
after laying down the criteria on the table, after laying, uh, making clear what quality means in the class, the second thing you can do is to encourage dialogic feedback with the students during the creation process or the creative process or the simply the performance of the task. Now, what I'd like to emphasize here is that it's not just a feedback but dialogic, meaning to say there's a meaningful conversation between the students and the teacher. It could be students and students also about, um, about their work, the progress of their work, or their output in the end. All right? So, here are the things that you can do, the steps that you can actually follow when doing synchronous peer or teacher dialogue. So first is what you can uh, do um, is that you ask the student first where they are, where they're coming from, and help them explain or assess uh, their work so far or their progress so far. So we don't start right away with the sermon, right? And this is what you did, the, the mistakes that they've done. Uh, you've been respons responsible, you missed a deadline, something like that. So let's not do that yet, okay? Uh, but first, let's um, get it from the students, um, like where are they coming from, what's happening to them at the moment in the creative process, so that we would have a more humanistic approach to assessment. We understand, again, where they come from. And then after that, you comment the students' progress, if there, there is one, and if they're stuck, at least you tell them something like um, you commend them for the effort that they exerted to consult with you, the humility, the openness to get feedback from you, and other positive messages that you can think of to raise their self-esteem or to boost their self-esteem and not let them down right away. And then finally, you can also explain the what the missing things are or the missing elements in their work are or in other words the gaps that they have to still fulfill in order to get better grade or to improve their work but we don't just get stuck with what's missing or the mistakes that they've done in the past but we help our students um, think of options for future direction now we let of course the students decide on their own what would be the best course of action moving forward. But we also, as SAGE in the class, uh, help them decide by uh, discussing with them the pros and cons and some suggestions you can give them on how to move forward. But again, at the end of the day, the students will decide for themselves. Here's an example of a synchronous sphere dialogue. All right, if you want to have your students talk about their work first uh, in a non-competitive way, and help each other better their work, all right? And here's an example of a teacher dialogue asynchronously using Google Docs. If you don't have much time to do a one-on-one -on -one talks or di dialogic feedback with your students. And this also works well, say, for example, you're away and you couldn't uh, entertain your students uh, for a one-on-one -on -one dialogue, then this would be a, an, an alternative that would help you give them immediate feedback and not waste time because they could already improve their work uh, right there and then, okay, in real time even, okay? Now, um, as I mentioned a while ago, during the dialogic feedback, you could also do self-assessment with them first. Now, before you, of course, uh, tell them, what what you think about their work so you can do this in many ways and you could do either do this in the middle of their work or after their work but i would suggest you do uh, you do one maybe for informal or in, uh, formally uh, through follow through the following samples or mechanisms like uh, what i would usually do is have an asynchronous self-assessment right here wherein they grade themselves and take note that i uh, I included criteria that are not very conceptual, not very particular about the lesson, right? But more on their work ethics and the creative process that they went through, okay? So here, again, you're trying to assess their 21st century skills like productivity, collaborative skills, sense of initiative, and other skills that are very important for that particular task, okay? If you want to do it in a fun way, like last week I did this with my students using Padlet, allow, I allow them to rate themselves from one to five uh, as to how successful they were in doing the concept paper. But I reminded them that it's not just about the quality of their work, but their work ethics. No? So uh, some of them even uh, had a fun time because they inserted fun images that would encapsulate their 
feelings or their attitude towards their work. So you can do this also in your class so that self-assessment will not be too serious, but it can also be a fun activity and that they also learn from each other's mistakes and reflections. Okay. We don't stop with dialogic feedback. There are so many ways that we can still offer to them in order to, um, to close the gaps or to, in other words, improve their work. We can give them additional sources to relearn concepts, like you put a link from, a, say, for example, a British Council website or any helpful website that would help them independently learn from their own mistakes if you don't have much time to reteach these concepts in class. You can also hold work or write shops, say one or two, that would help you uh, like gauge whether they're doing it right in the middle of the creative process or in the doing of the performance task. And you can, again, you can go around and see what they're doing, whether they're arguing, whether they are, um, they're wrong in following the instructions. So at least you don't wait for them in the end to commit mistakes and you know have a poor grade. But in the middle, you already tell them what to improve so that again, they can um, have, uh, they can maximize the learning experience along the way of uh, doing the task and not miss out on many things. And you can also offer a synchronous or synchronous means of feedback. Like what, one time I, uh, I uh, had dialogic feedback with the student using phone call. Some of you can afford video call also like Zoom. All right. And then there are many other means that you can use for feedback. All right, like there's an app already like uh, Turnitin or website Turnitin that wherein you just record your feedback. If you're tired of, you know, typing your lengthy uh, feedback to your students, you can just record your feedback and then the students will just click it and listen to your feedback, lengthy feedback and uh, detailed comprehensive feedback about their work. And you can also use Flipgrid you know, for this if you're tired of, again, typing your long feedback in Google Docs. Okay. And uh, you can also give a lot of attempts for them. The important thing here is that you give them many chances to improve their work and not just create their work one time, big time. Okay, So it's implicitly telling them or teaching them that in real life, people really commit mistakes. You cannot be perfect in one try unless you're, of course, a genius. But uh, it's important to let them know that it's okay to make mistakes. It's okay to fail. It's okay not to do it right the first time. What matters is that they have many chances to be better. And that would, again, make them feel like the work is not too stressful because, and that the pressure is not too heavy on them because, again, they're given many chances to be better and produce excellent work later on. They're not judged right away. And it's not enough that we give uh, chances to close the gap. It's also equally important that we give them high quality feedback information. Okay. And at the same time, it's also important that we boost their self esteem, their positive motivation, because that alone will actually drive them to successfully finish the task. Now, how do we do this? Now, before, uh, good job, well done, thumbs up, you rock, you're the man, way to go, stamp on their on their wrist would be enough to boost their confidence or to boost their self-esteem. But you know what? Uh, these curt remarks, uh, simple remarks, though they're flatteries, would just last for a few minutes or one day. But in my case, uh, in my opinion also, what would be more long-lasting, what would be more sustainable is to give things of high-quality feedback. And what are these? Number one, positive feedback. Number two, precise feedback. And number three, practical feedback. Now, let me have them one by one. So for positive, uh, we all know this as teachers that uh, we give a feedback sandwich to our students. Like we start with the positive, then the negative, and then end with the positive. So in a way, as, a, as what one song goes, um, break it their break their hearts gently with a feedback sandwich. Okay, you don't crush their hearts right away. So you can start by saying, you know, I appreciate this. I like the way you did this. I'm very impressed with the turnout of your work because I admire this aspect of your work. I am surprised that you were able to do this. Or you can say your astounding work is worth emulating because enumerate the good things. Or you should continue doing this because blah, blah, blah. 
Okay? So again, in that, in these particular words, you would be able to somehow boost their confidence and our students would be proud of themselves because of these comments. For precise comments, let's avoid saying that uh, your reflection paper is good, the short film that you produce is bad, you have a great TikTok dance, you have a nice collage right here, or uh, it's just a so-so skip. Now, these words that I highlighted are not going to be very helpful for our students. So again, be very specific. Like say, for example, what a very insightful reflection paper. Um, what a incohesive short film. Or you can say that, oh, a well-choreographed TikTok dance or a very picturesque collage that's worthy of a display in a museum. Or a um, entertaining skip. Okay, say for example, so very specific, uh, very specific adjectives that you can give your students so that they know exactly what their strength is. Okay, now you can also, number three, give practical feedback. And when we say practical, uh, we mean here that these comments should be realistic and doable. These tips should be something that they can still work on. And uh, that these are things that can be applicable to other similar tasks. That the comments will not just be good for this particular task. But say, for example, other writing tasks that they will confront in the future, whether in college or in their master's degree. Uh, usually, these are the same skills that they have to master or these are the same attitudes that they have to have in order to succeed in uh, these particular tasks. And in that way, we develop lifelong skills, hone their character, not just the output, because again, what matters at the end of the day is that they become better individuals, better professionals, better people uh, in the future when they're already out of our classroom. And if there is a need for them to relearn lessons, practical lessons, then they have to be retaught in class or asynchronously the way I taught you a while ago. Now, here's a sample high-quality feedback, written form, okay, in relation to the high performance tasks that we uh, mentioned a while ago. So let me read this to you. The haiku subtly captures your sincere longing for your rel relative using vivid imagery. So take note of the word vivid here, then very specific adjective. However, here we go. Uh, this is the gap already, the precise gap. However, a punctuation added would clearly show the separation of the two juxtaposed images. But we don't stop there. No, We don't just you know, give uh, what's missing. We tell them how to move forward. Let's have the last sentence. This is also similar to how you use punctuations when separating ideas in sentences or clauses for the reader's easy understanding. You may check out some models in this source so you to help them out to see how punctuations are used and where they are strategically placed. So in this precise and um, practical comment, you help them move forward. You help them relearn uh, the concept of using punctuation because they're going to be using the same skill in other writings in the future. Okay, so you notice how the three P's work in this particular feedback in written form. This time, I'd like to show you how I did it in oral form with my student here who presented in one of my classes in uh, academic writing. And uh, I gave feedback at the end uh, for this particular student, but I did it with my class so that my class would also learn from this student and do well also in their own presentations later on. So notice how I uh, use three P's in uh, this oral feedback. It's not yet done, okay? Now, quick comments lang, Gwen, and I hope that you will all also listen because um, this will be uh, things, practical things that you have to consider when you're presenting your paper whenever it's a national conference or international conference. So just simply inside the classroom. Okay, number one is I like Gwen signposting, right? You know where she is, where she's leading you. No, it's very clear the, the, the parts of the paper, okay? Not only in the slides, but the way she speaks, no? the way she transitions from one slide to another is very clear. And I guess her, her training in debate helped her no? to be more, to be clearer. In transitioning from one point to another. Next is, of course, I I admire the fluency, right? Very uh, uh, spontaneous way of explanation. 
the clarity of voice is also commendable. And then, I like that you have sources for your answers, like you can still quote people, <laughs> even when you're answering. So that only shows now that she's a very intelligent um, researcher. No? So she knows page by page what she's doing, all right? And again, you cannot feign that kind of scholarship. No? You have to show that by quoting people, if you can, as much as possible. So very good, no? very uh, impressive. Another thing that's very impressive is that she can still smile even if, you know, she's run, uh, she feels like she's running out of time, right? But um, she, she feels, she, she appears relaxed. But when you, when you talk, when it's as if you're not relaxed, no, because it's a little bit fast. So you have to relax along with your smile. Just, you know, relax. This is not debate. Right? So you can take your time. You're not arguing with people. So it's okay to take your time. Just, you know, feel the, the vibe of your presentation. Okay? Just enjoy the ride. And yeah, despite that, I, I know for sure Gwen is still nervous at this point, even if she's a master debater already. But the confidence is simply as, as, as astounding for a young person like you. I think I had that confidence when I was already like 26 years old, not even mga 30 pa yata, no? So uh, it's a it's a great thing that students like you, even in PISA, you've already been being groomed to be confident as early as 16, 17, 18. No? And um, yeah, confidence is something that's very unique to a person. And finally, I like that even if it's a humanities-related study, you, you were able to show us how systematic it is, the graphs and all, right? Now, quantitative can be also part of a qualitative research, right? So we cannot always naman, do away with numbers. It can also be at some point be needed, especially for content analysis, wherein you will be counting the frequency of occurrences of themes. Diba? So in a way, um, Gwen was able to show us how to scientifically still do a qualitative research. Okay? Now moving on, Gwen, just some points for improvement. And again, everybody should listen here. So number one, slow down speaking. You still have ample time. I tell you, okay? So maximize that to explain yourself clearly, even more clearly, because I think you have to pause in between sentences. Like yung mga periods, they're not too obvious. Okay? Parang wala kang period. Tuloy-tuloy, no? Parang mga debaters. Okay? So, yeah. Please study that. Uh, enjoy the vibe. Alright? So, um, calm yourself. Okay? Well, hindi yung parang susugod. No, sa laban. Hindi ganon. Kasi debate ganon. No? So, conference is just plain. No, it's cool dapat. Alright. So, just relax yourself. Number two is, I think, um, perhaps yung visual representation ng, ang awkward kasi kapag mag-circle graph ka. You're using a circle graph kasi only have one. Parang usually kasi circle graph is used for six or more elements. Three or more elements, pwede pa. Pero it's more advisable for many allocations. Pag maraming slices. Pag isa lang or dalawa, it looks so awkward. No? So you might want to find a different um, representation. Perhaps a table na lang for all, something like that. You don't have to show numbers naman for everything. Uh, so just one great table for all perhaps, no? and then just show the salient features in the next slides. Ganon, okay? You don't have, if, if it, and I think it will also save you space. Though maganda siya, kaya lang kapag konti yung data, hindi siya magandang tignan. Alright? So, yan. Practical tips yan for everyone. Circle graphs are supposed to be for three or more elements only. And then, um, yeah, pauses in between, okay? Para may emphasis din. And then, would you like to include the research questions also um, in the introduction part? Parang the bridge between intro and your research questions. This is why I studied about. This is my major question. Though that it doesn't have to be a long question, parang points lang, bullet points about what did you tackle in your research. Parang this is the big question. These are the minor questions. Okay? References need not to be too many. Ma choose lang around. But what's what's very what what can be visible in a slide? You don't have to put everything, okay? Five or seven of the most widely used just a paper, okay, na yon, okay? And for everyone, don't say research studies, ha? Huh? That's redundant. So either research lang or study, okay? Don't worry because it's a common mistake of Filipinos. 
All right. So all in all, uh, great job for Gwen. Let's have a virtual clap for Gwen. Thank you so much, Gwen, for gracing us with your presence this Thursday morning. All right. And I hope that you all learn from Gwen and that you would also do well as she and even better no? now that she already showed you what it's like. Okay, so in the fourth quarter pa naman. So you still have time to be like Gwen for three more quarters. Okay, thank you, Gwen. Uh, you may leave already. I know you have a class in a while. So thank you so much once again. And I hope that uh, we all wish you all the best. Okay, so I hope you were able to notice the three piece in that comprehensive feedback. And I hope that you would also be able to apply the same in your next performance task. All right, now moving forward. Um, Let's have the last principle. Okay, the seventh principle is about using feedback to improve teaching. So we use the feedback that we give to our students to improve our pedagogy. At the same time, we also learn from the feedback of our students as to the assessment process that they experience. Okay, so first is you can actually gauge where the students are, whether the students are mastering getting the the, the assessment or the, the lesson with the depth of discussion and participation. Assessment does not start with, you know, performance tasks. Even the way the students uh, answer your questions can already be good starting points for assessing uh, how they master the skills or how they can exhibit or apply the skills in real discussion setting. You can also observe them go around when they do pair or group work because, again, as I mentioned a while ago, it is an opportunity for you to stop them from making further mistakes because you've already spotted these mistakes while they were doing their drafts or while they're discussing about their work. The results of the assessment can be very important um, a basis for reteaching lessons that are needed to be uh, mastered by the students. So please do not let these teaching moments let um, just pass you by, okay? Because um, if we just be blind about the things that they haven't mastered yet, then they will just we will just pass them on to the next teacher without really helping the students master these skills and who knows these uh, particular mistakes will just be fossilized later on all right so it's our responsibility to teach them the right way as much as possible and the patterns of concerns during consultations can actually help you address the general concern of the class like for example many of them complain about uh, about difficulty being original or not having enough sources for their performance task. So it's the time for you to intervene and help them out from their dilemma, from their uh, stagnation, and help them again move forward by giving them a helping hand, okay, being the adult or being the sage in the class. And the reactions to comments and suggestions that they receive from you, say, for example, they don't understand when you said um, use co uh, be cohesive in your ideas in the paragraph. So you might be thinking or assuming that they know what cohesive means, but they haven't mastered it pala yet from their previous classes. So you have to teach them again what cohesiveness means when writing paragraphs. Okay? So there you go. What are our takeaways for this session? Number one is that we give importance to the discussion of quality in class. Explicit, explicit discussion of what quality is when they um, perform their task. And uh, in order to have a meaningful conversation with our students, let's engage in dialogic feedback. We're in further, we discuss about that quality, what we expect, what our standards are, and uh, what we would like our students to improve on. Because at the end of the day, we would want our students to learn, to maximize the learning experience, and be better individuals in the future. So... Thank you so much for listening. Here are the references that you can use for your own study and for your own application of sustainable assessment in your class. Thank you so much. And uh, I wish you all the best in your face-to-face -face classes, in your pilot classes, in your high flex classes, or whatever type of class you're gonna be in the you're gonna be having in the future. I wish you all the best. And if you have any concerns about this presentation, please just comment below or email me at krakitiko at gmail.com. Please like and share this presentation so that more of our teachers would learn about sustainable assessment. So once again, this is Corneli Rakitiko, and this is PNU Talks.